Good morning. This is an official good morning for our time of worship of Creevewood Baptist Church. And I'm so glad to see everybody. Can't see people joining us online, but glad you're here as well. If you are a guest this morning, we do extend to you a special word of greeting. And I want to draw your attention to the card in the pew rack in front of you that says, Hey, we're so glad you're here because we are glad you're here. I ask that you take the card, fill out the requested information, and return it to me. I'll be in the pastor's corner after the service. That is on your left as you exit the sanctuary. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who are lonely and need a friend, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors. And I'm so glad y'all are able to be here this holiday weekend. Our campus, of course, is closed on Tuesday, the 4th. And speaking of holidays, uh, Pastor Ray wraps up his extended length of time away for these three weeks. He'll be back tomorrow. And uh, Tim and Becca, as I understand it, got off okay, not from Nashville, but from Atlanta to go eat um, gelato and pasta, as he informed us on their tour of Italy, and we certainly pray for them traveling mercies. Speaking of prayer, let us go to the Lord in prayer. During this time, lift up your own prayer of praise to God. What would you praise him for this morning? Scripture tells us, do not have other gods besides me, says the Lord. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. So your prayer may simply be praising God for being the one true God. We turn to God in our time of confession. In the book of 1 John, we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Pray your own prayer of confession to God. And now turn to God with your prayer of thanksgiving. What are you especially thankful for? And of course, this weekend, we are thankful that we can be in a country and worship freely. We are not in fear in this room during our worship service. Scripture also tells us, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him.
And now for our prayers of intercession. Perhaps this morning you yourself are burdened. I think we all know other people who are carrying burdens. And we also pray this morning for the persecuted church, the underground church that does not have the freedom to worship openly. In Ephesians, we read, pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. And let us pray the model prayer our Lord taught us using debts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 89, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When the waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You shattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours the world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously arise and praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, steadfast love, and faithfulness go before you. If you're able, why don't you stand with us and we'll worship together. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. 
You're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep. Your grace is more, what grace is found is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me. comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay come on I want to hear you sing it out and Lord I need you oh I need you Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day, darling. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the When my 
Good morning, boys and girls. Do any of you know what this is? What does it have on it? It's to measure. Do you see the numbers? So we can measure things that are long. We can measure how tall things are. And here are some things that we can measure. Flower. Do you know what kind of flower this is? It's a sunflower. Sunflowers can be up to about six feet tall. There's a lot of them that are about six feet tall. You know what this is? What kind of dinosaur? T-Rex, right, it's the T-Rex. It's about 40 feet long. What is this? Semi truck, exactly, it's a semi truck. Have you ever seen these? on the highway, they're about 70 feet long. <laughs> what is this one? Rockosaurus, long neck, a long neck dinosaur. The biggest dinosaur, the biggest known dinosaur, isn't it? It's about 80 feet long. 80 feet long. It's the blue whale. It's the largest animal. It's, it lives in the ocean. You're right, it does live in the ocean. It's 100 feet long. <laughs> and what is this? A tree. Well, a lot of the trees that you see outside will be about 25 to 40 feet tall. But there's a redwood tree that can grow to over 300 feet tall. <laughs> so we have been talking about some pretty big things, right? And these things can be measured, but I want to talk to you about something that is so big that it cannot be measured. And that is God's love. God's love is amazing. God's love has no limits. It has no end. It lasts forever. God knows, God knows everything about you, and he loves you. That's right, he does. He loves you. Yes, he does love everybody he created. So God's love always surrounds us, and it never leaves you. God's love never changes because he never changes. God loves you so, so much. And he will always love you because God is love. No matter what is going on or what you do, nothing can change that. 
God will always love you. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you that you love us so much that you never change. Thank you that you give us your word so we can know who you are and how to love. Please help us to learn more about that love for us. We love you. Amen. Remember when your hope is lost and faith is shaken. Remember when you wonder if you're going to make it. There's a hand stretched out through your deepest doubt. We can't pretend to see the ending or what's coming up ahead. We don't know the story of tomorrow, but we can stay close to the one who knows. We can trust our God. He knows what he's doing. It may hurt now. We won't be ruined. It might seem there's an ocean in between, but he's holding on to you and me. He's never gonna be. to have us close we can trust our God cause he knows what he's doing though it might hurt now we won't be ruined might seem there's an ocean in between but he's holding on to you and me he's never gonna be And Jody and Chris, I appreciate, and we all do, your being with us, as you are, especially, y'all don't know this, but they were in Wisconsin or someplace last night up until this morning, actually. So, thank the Lord, the airlines did their job in getting you here. I appreciate that. Today, we continue in the series, Partners in Joy in Philippians, so you can be turning to chapter 2 if you have your Bible. And so far, as we've been reading, Paul has been sharing principles of what it means to follow Christ. And I know we all appreciated how Tim drew these out the last couple of weeks for us. Two Sundays ago, if you all remember, he held something up. Do you remember what it was? Passport, very good. 
And that's a reminder that our citizenship and our allegiance belongs somewhere else, to the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. And we read in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And Tim's question to us all was, where is your identity? Are you actually living a life worthy of the gospel? Are you living by the Spirit or by the empire of this world? And last week, we covered the first part of chapter 2 in that hymn or poem, Tim said, about the nature and humility and majesty of Jesus. Our church believes Christ changes lives. I pause there for an amen from all the pews. And we want to see every life changed by Christ, starting with our own. And today we'll conclude chapter 2, picking up in verse 19. And I have two items to help illustrate these verses. And they are, anybody know what's in this hand? A mirror, yes. Y'all can see yourselves. And in this hand, a magnifying glass. That's exactly right. And we'll be talking about these as we look at two people that Paul is writing about. The first is a name we use today, and that name is Timothy. Everybody say Timothy. No problem there. Now, can you say Epaphroditus? Very good. Bill Stevens has been coaching me on saying Epaphroditus. I'm, well, I'm going to have to say it several more times, so we'll, we'll see as we go along. But I appreciate that. So let's turn to chapter 2, verses 19 and following. And I will be reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be encouraged when I hear news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will, be, who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character, because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father." Therefore, I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am convinced in the Lord that I myself will also come quickly. But I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and a minister to my need. Since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him but also on me, so that I would not have one grief on top of another. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice when you see him again and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord and, or with all joy and hold men like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Join me in prayer, please. Our God, I do thank you for your word. I thank you for the Spirit even now of the risen Christ. I thank you, God, for the change that you make in each person who calls Jesus Lord. And God, I pray that we would not be satisfied until we have encountered you this morning. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I held up the magnifying glass and mirror, and I think they are good images. And Paul has been giving us this broader picture 
like I said in this letter, until now. And he's going to take the magnifying glass to two lives, Timothy's and Epaphroditus, and he's going to see what their character is in Christ. The witness of the church is Jesus. The witness of those who claim Jesus as Lord should be Jesus. But too often, the world looks at those who profess Jesus as Lord and it simply sees a reflection back of itself. That's a false gospel and a betrayal of who Jesus is. Why would our culture look at such believers and want to convert when it's seen a picture of itself? It is already that. The image Tim gave us last week is sad but true. Many people view Jesus as simply a get-out-of-hell free card kept in their back pocket to be pulled out later, they think. Sadly, too, such a false understanding means that we are so heavenly-minded, we are no earthly good. Jesus' incarnation shows us how to be truly human, to live here and now for him. We are part of his kingdom here and now, and we as followers of Jesus are his new creation We welcome the magnifying glass to be turned to our own lives, our witness of what we say and do, what we spend our money on, what we value, what our relationships are, how we live our own lives. We should welcome and stand such inspection. By this, in authenticity, we show our neighbors, our friends, our schoolmates, and the world around us, who Jesus is. We reflect then his image, not only here within these walls and to one another, but to the outside world. You see, we do not live isolated. We as believers are called together, just as we are here this morning, to be the body of Christ, his church. And one of the things that I really love about the letter of Philippians is it gives us a glimpse of what that dynamic is like. And that's not set in Philippi. It's the church doing ministry with fellow believers. Paul is speaking about Christ to those who follow Christ, those who are his church in Philippi. And he will get very specific in matters concerning that church Not today, but in chapters 3 and 4. But now he cites two believers that we just read about, Timothy and Epaphroditus. So let's take the magnifying glass ourselves and look at these verses in some depth. You know the setting. A month ago now, when we started this series, Pastor Ray explained that Paul is in prison. Now where in prison is a matter of some conjecture. Ray gave an 85% probability that it is Rome, and that is the historical understanding. I will say that I was encouraged by a brother to make a pitch for Caesarea, but I can't do that, sorry, Bill, since I am more inclined to think that Paul is in Ephesus. But regardless of the place, he is in prison, and he is with Timothy and Epaphroditus and some other believers. In verses 19 through 24, we just read, of course, concerned themselves with Timothy, and the rest of the chapter is Epaphroditus. And, of course, the recipients is the church in Philippi. So think about this chronologically. And to us, our mind is... What happens later comes before, and that can sort of mess with your mind because Paul's talking about sending Timothy. But first, he's going to send Epaphroditus. And I think he's going to send Epaphroditus with this letter. And then, as he says, once he sees how things turn out with him, he's going to send Timothy. And he's going to send Timothy to see if this letter had its intended effect on the church. 
and then Timothy's going to get back with Paul, and he's going to report back, and then Paul himself is going to come to the church at Philippi. So that's how I see it playing out. And we start with looking at Timothy. Now, Timothy is probably well known to you if you've read some of the New Testament. He is mentioned numerous times. There's a couple of letters which are 1st and 2nd Timothy. He's a native of Lystra where Paul preached his first missionary journey. And in Acts chapter 16, we read that Paul decides to take Timothy along with him on the second missionary journey and they go to Philippi together. So Timothy is someone the Philippian church knows. And Paul holds this magnifying glass, as it were, up into his life and says, let me tell you about Timothy. Verse 20, for I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interest. All seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Timothy has the same mindset as Paul. Timothy's face, faith is authentic and his actions grow from that faith. We can say he has rearranged his whole life on account of the gospel. He has a genuine concern for believers in Philippi. His metal has been tested. Paul alludes to that in verse 22, but you know his proven, proven character. The Greek word there that Paul uses, in fact, means going through an ordeal and standing the test as a result. The last characterization that Paul uses, I think, is very moving and touching, like a son with his father. And then in verse 25, we are introduced to Epaphroditus. We would like to know more about him, I think. I would, but we don't get a whole lot of information about Epaphroditus. Of course, he came from the church in Philippi. We'll read later on in the book of Philippians that he brought a financial gift to Paul. We're not sure of the scope of his mission, but it seems that he was also meant to minister to Paul and with Paul there, even while Paul was in prison. And carrying money with him, he probably did not travel alone. But while he was there, or some people would conjecture, on his way to Paul, he gets sick. And the sickness is so bad that he almost dies. Paul became very concerned about Epaphroditus. Word gets back to the Philippian church, and they become concerned about Epaphroditus. Then word gets back to Paul and Epaphroditus while Paul's in prison that the Philippian church is concerned about Epaphroditus, and they become anxious. So it's quite a, a caring, even though separated by distance of Ephesus, maybe, to uh, where Paul is. So Paul resolves to send Epaphroditus back to his home church. And in all likelihood, I think that he's carrying this very letter with him. He sends Epaphroditus back for Epaphroditus' sake, for the Philippian church's sake, and I think for Paul's sake. Now there could be some underlying tension in this dynamic now, if Ray were here, he'd said, I know you can't imagine a church with tension, can you? But he's not, so I'm not going to say that. Epaphroditus had brought the financial gift, and that is a good illustration to think of our, where our tithes and offerings go. Ministry happens, and ministry requires oftentimes money. And we'll read more about that also at the end of the book. But Paul uses five words to describe Epaphroditus in verse 25. He says, My brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need. And I think those five words speak to us today. Brother means that we 
are redefined in our family relationships by the gospel. We are adopted by the Spirit of Christ, we who believe in him. And we are part of the new creation that way. Co-worker signifies that the gospel redirects a believer's purpose in life. What you do stems from who you are in Christ. From the beginning, the church has been the place where people who normally may not hang out together do hang out together. Different ethnic and socioeconomic classes of people. Fellow soldier, perhaps that is colored by the setting of Paul's prison experience, being among Roman military praetorian guard. It also denotes how serious, really, our battle of faith is, not only in the first century world, but in the 21st century world. And messenger is more than just a messenger. Epaphroditus is sent as a representative of his church, to actively minister to Paul. And minister, this word in Greek more, is more like an office, really, like a public servant, someone who has duties and performs public service. In the Jewish context, it is also someone who performs priestly duties at the temple. And either one, then, complements Epaphroditus. Now there is speculation that Paul is building up Epaphroditus to preemptively defend him against perhaps some criticism in his home church. After all, if he was sent to bring money to Paul and to minister to Paul in, while Paul's in prison, and he comes back to Philippi, why is he back home when Paul's still in prison? Did he fail in his assignment, as it were? Did he just get homesick and Paul sending him home out of pity? Another thing about, this is fun talking about Ray when he's not here. So another thing about Pastor Ray is he's taught me a phrase called making a generous assumption about people. And that is where we don't really don't jump first to a conclusion of thinking ill about a person's motives or thinking there's something below sinister below the surface. But a generous assumption is thinking the person's motives are pure and that the, what is presented is what is meant. There's nothing sinister underneath. So my generous assumption for the church in Philippi is that Paul is simply building up Epaphroditus out of his experience with him and concern for him. I think it could well be that Paul is sending Epaphroditus back as a gift, his own offering back to the church in Philippi because they were so anxious for his health. So we have seen really what we would call maybe uh, three giants of the faith in these verses. Paul, who wrote the letter, and he wrote it about Timothy and Epaphroditus. But one thing I want to say to us, dear church, is that it's a mistake if we read about these three believers and think of them as giants living out a faith that is unattainable for us as a way to live out our faith. Yes, Paul was exceptionally called by Jesus, but he was called to be a follower of Jesus, just as we each here at Creedwood Baptist Church are called to follow Jesus. You, as a believer, are a new creation in Christ. You're changed by Christ. You are different. And what you do flows from who you are, flows from that identity, because, yes, every life is changed by Christ because Jesus changes everything. It is essential for each believer to be part of the local body of believers, the body of Christ. It's a paradoxical statement for a believer following Christ and not being part of the body of Christ. So who, you, who do you want, I thought this is an interesting question, who do you want to be your fellow church member? I would want someone like Timothy and Epaphroditus, wouldn't you? 
But the real question is, when I look in the mirror, do I see a person like that as a church member? Are you living in the image of Christ to present Christ's image back out to the world? Or are you simply reflecting the world and its culture back to itself? And there's no attraction to that. And it also is not a good representation of Jesus. So turn the the magnifying glass on yourself. Do you care about your own interest or are you concerned about the interest of others, even here as members of this church in this very church. We're going to close today with the hymn of response, which I think is Amazing Grace. Okay, Amazing Grace. And as you sing, think about your own self. What image do you reflect? And if you have a decision to make, if you would like prayer, or maybe you would like to journey with us as we do our best to show Christ to this community. Stand and sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that sings. Go now in peace, committed to reflecting the image of Christ to a world that needs to see Jesus in you. Go in peace.